Hello, everyone. I see the number of participants rising. Um, thanks for joining. Can you see all the presentation on the screen? I hope so. Lina, just give me a, a quick sign if you can see this. Perfect. <laughs> Great. So then I would say, uh, welcome everyone to our third episode of this Tumivolt Charging Station webinar. Today's topic is the battle for e-mobility, fuel cell electric um, vehicles versus battery electric vehicles. My name is Marvin Stolz and I'll be your moderator for today's session. I work for um, Tumivolt, which is a global project at GIZ. And I work there as e-mobility advisor. Um, and we um, form part of Tumi Vault uh, as the e-mobility branch for the transformative urban mobility initiative Tumi. Here we focus on the improvement of framework conditions for electric mobility in emerging and developing countries. And I would say, um, let's first have a look on what we are planning to do over the next hour in this webinar. So here you can see the agenda overview. After a short introduction, uh, we will directly uh, start with the expert presentation from our speaker, Professor Dr. Jürgen Garche, who I will also introduce in a second. And afterwards, we will then go into the live Q&A session, which my colleague Lena Stiller will moderate. At the Tumivolt charging station, of course, our goal is to charge up everyone's knowledge around all things of e-mobility. We already held two webinars about raw materials um, and future battery technology. Uh, sorry. Some technical problems here. <laughs> sorry for the disruption. And you, of course, can also find those episodes on YouTube on our uh, Tumi YouTube channel. For today's um, charging station, we chose a rather yeah, I would say provocative title, um, which is the battle for e-mobility. And with battle, we um, refer to the discussions about one key question, which um, many mobility experts around the globe try to answer. And this is which technology will drive the future of mobility? Will it be run by fuel cell electric vehicles or will future mobility mainly rely on battery electric vehicles? You see, uh, both propulsion technologies have their similarities and differences, of course, but can be summarized under the category of electric mobility. Both technologies essentially use electricity to power electric motors, which then drive all kinds of vehicles like cars, trucks, and uh, potentially even beyond that. Both technologies um, also can bring us closer to carbon neutrality, but nevertheless, um, we are observing that there's a lot of debate which technology is the best or the most suited for, for the future. And from my point of view, uh, supporters from both sides uh, sometimes show very strong opinions about the opposing technology. Uh, both sides say their technology is the best option in terms of sustainability or in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of costs, etc., etc. And uh, apparently it's not easy to navigate through all these different arguments. And therefore we try to dive a bit deeper today with this episode into this competition of propulsion technologies uh, beca because we believe that uh, it's a highly relevant um, topic uh, in the field of e-mobility and also in the context of um, development cooperation. And as you already may have seen in the announcement uh, for the webinar, we decided to split this episode into two parts in part one. So today we will answer how and if fuel cell electric vehicles can be used for sustainable development in the mobility sector and in what application cases and also uh, for what vehicle types this makes the most sense. And part two, uh, which will be held in September uh, 16, will then focus on the potential of battery electric vehicles for sustainable mobility applications and uh, shed light on on both technologies as well so to start um, with our topic of today i'm happy to introduce you to our expert speaker uh, professor dr jürgen garche 
Um, he works as independent consultant in the field of fuel cells and batteries. And he has more than 50 years of experience in this field and has also formerly been director of the electrochemical energy storage and conversion division of the Center for Solar Energy and Hydrogen uh, Research in German. It's called uh, ZSW. Further, he acted as deputy speaker of the advisory board of the German National Organization for Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technology, NOV GmbH. So I think uh, with his experience, uh, he's an excellent guest speaker for our series and uh, we're really to have you on board. So a very warm welcome from my side, uh, Professor Garche. But before I hand over to you, uh, just two more technical information for our participants. Um, first, there's a chat function in this webinar. So everyone's more than welcome to, to put your question questions into the, the chat window. And after the presentation, we will go into the live Q&A session which uh, Lena will moderate, as mentioned, and we will redirect every question to Professor Gasse then. And second point I want to, to raise before we start, um, to improve this webinar, we will have a very short survey at the end of the webinar. So if you have a minute to spare, we would really appreciate um, your feedback uh, to, of course, get better ourselves as well. So yeah, that would be it from my side so far. I, I think we are ready to start. And uh, with that, I also, I hand over the control to you, Professor Garche, to share your presentation, which you prepared for today. And I would say um, the stage, stage would be yours. And thank you very much. So, yeah. Perfect. Well, now we can could see. Could you it. hear me? Could you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hello. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, I was uh, introduced, a uh, short uh, introduction again. Uh, the most important 50 years battery and fuel cell experience, so I'm an old man. Uh, I think 50 years ago, we have never been born. Uh, what I am doing, I was uh, retired in 2004. What I am doing, I am writing a uh, book. Here you have an overview about the books. Um, that's the uh, most heaviest book, you see Encyclopedia. And there are 12 kilogram, and five uh, volumes and uh, 120 euro per kilogram. But that is unfortunately not my money. That is the publishing house. It's the hottest book, you see. Uh, safety of lithium batteries. Lithium batteries have a very high energy density, but uh, the safety is also an uh, issue. Okay, the content uh, of that uh, introduction in the fuel cell electric vehicle area, you could see that here, starting with electromobility history. The working principles of the fuel cell, different fuel cell types, and then going from the cell via the stack, via the fuel cell system to the fuel cell electric vehicle. And uh, then the final question battery vehicle or fuel cell vehicle, and then the summary. The history, uh, starting with the history of batteries. The first primary battery was developed by Perry and Walter. Uh, you could see it's a system here or here. Uh, it was a zinc copper uh, system. The second step in the history is the uh, basic for the uh, fuel cell, it's the hydrogen water electrolyzes. And you could see four people uh, where uh, have uh, developed the water electrolysis principle. Uh, why is it late? Uh, you need uh, electrical source, electricity source. And that was the water battery, uh, which uh, drove uh, the electrolysis in order to produce uh, hydrogen. And the fuel cell itself. Uh, was developed by uh, Gove in 1839. 
So that is the history of the uh, electric chemical power sources and the history of the uh, battery electric vehicle. You could see that here, that is the lead acid battery uh, for that car. And uh, in 1899, the electric car is uh, across the uh, 100 hour kilometer. Uh, or 100 kilometer per hour border. And in the time of uh, 19, 1910, uh, about 30% of all cars were electric cars. Uh, you could see uh, one example here, that is the taxi. And um, the battery was not charged uh, on board, the battery was changed. Here you have the battery and uh, then the battery is coming in the car. The uh, um, fuel cell uh, history started 1959 um, with the farm tractor, with the 15 kilowatt alkaline fuel cell, and the first uh, car electro van you could see on the right side. Uh, that was the GM electro van with uh, a PEM fuel cell and uh, 32 kilowatt. Uh, the interesting one, that was compressed hydrogen for the tractor. And here you could see that it is liquid uh, hydrogen and liquid uh, oxygen. That was uh, starting time uh, that is, uh, was not usual. Um, another, uh, History point are hydrogen internal combustion engine. So you have uh, not used uh, gasoline, you use the hydrogen, and you could see the first patent was already 1807 for a hydrogen car, and uh, later you could see that car uh, 1860 uh, one cylinder two stroke. The interesting one um, at that hydrogen internal combustion engine vehicle, you could see the storage uh, is here, and here uh, was the engine, and uh, the hydrogen uh, was ignited um, by a Volta battery. So uh, the ignition of the hydrogen air uh, mixture uh, was carried out by the Volta battery. So the patent uh, normally uh, is uh, used for 20 years, and uh, 20 years are over, and therefore BMW has uh, taken over that uh, principle. And uh, you could see so about 20 years ago, uh, so, uh, BMW presented uh, hydrogen internal combustion engine vehicles. Uh, you could see here the principle of the 750 car. That uh, is the uh, liquid hydrogen tank, uh, and that is the engine. The uh, uh, changes of the engine from the gasoline to the hydrogen uh, fuel is uh, very small, and uh, if that principle, the internal combustion uh, hydrogen vehicle, would work very well, that uh, would be easier uh, to introduce the car in the market than the fuel cell vehicle. Uh, what uh, is the problem or the problems? You could see that here um, the um, combustion temperature of hydrogen is much higher than the combustion temperature of gasoline. And that means at the higher temperature of the uh, hydrogen uh, combustion, you have a higher content of NOx. And in order to reduce the NOx content, um, you have to reduce the combustion temper temperature. And that was done by in injecting uh, water into the uh, cylinder of the uh, engine. And that uh, injection of the water reduced uh, the efficiency. So the maximum efficiency of that uh, hydrogen uh, internal combustion engine 
on 37 percent and that is about the yeah, efficiency of the old diesel and uh, in order to come to uh, 50 percent efficiency uh, the BMW people and MIN people and Volvo and so on there are some uh, car manufacturers which are dealing with it or they deal with that uh, point um, to, uh, to change or to come to higher values. Uh, they have uh, specific uh, mixtures of the hydrogen, oxygen, engine modification. But finally, all uh, car manufacturers stopped uh, that uh, way with the hydrogen internal combustion engine. So, uh, future working uh, principles. Uh, principles is the next uh, topic. Um, what is uh, going on in the fuel cells? The hydrogen and the oxygen is reacting to water, uh, and uh, in that reaction, a uh, large uh, heat is uh, developed. Uh, the heat is so large that normally you have an explosion in that uh, reaction. Uh, the hydrogen oxygen uh, explosion or the German Kneigers explosion. So, what you could see here is that is a direct chemical reaction. The hydrogen reacting, uh, reacting with the oxygen, four electrons are going from the hydrogen to the oxygen, and you get that uh, high reaction energy. Uh, that high reaction energy, unfortunately, that is in German. Or that is heat or that is moving and that is electricity. That is the traditional way to produce electricity and upon the reaction uh, energy you get about 30 up to 40 percent for electricity. That is not too much and therefore uh, the people has developed the other way. That is the not direct reaction of the hydrogen with the oxygen. Uh, that is the indirect reaction. The electrons uh, coming from the hydrogen are going via the load. It could be light or uh, uh, electric engine to the oxygen. And in that way, you could create much more electrical energy, about uh, 80 30 percent theoretical one, uh, but in the practical, we are coming to 50-60%. So the big question is only how uh, that uh, fuel cell pass is working. Um, that works in the following way. You extracted the electrons from the hydrogen with the help of a catalyst or with the help of high temperature. And that electrons then are going via the load and uh, going to the oxygen. And the, uh, uh, with the help of uh, catalysts and also high temperatures. Again, electrons are extracted with the help of catalysts and high temperature going via uh, the load and uh, going in the oxygen. So, in order to have a continuous flow of the charge, um, we need additional to the electron flow, what you could see here, a flow of the charge through the electrolyte. The electrolyte is uh, normally liquid, and uh, the ions, the protons, or the OH ions are transporting the charge. By the way, um, that is the same working principles for the battery. Uh, what you have seen here for the uh, fuel cells, that's uh, the same uh, scheme for the lead acid battery. Also, uh, electrons are going from the lead via the uh, load uh, to the lead dioxide. So the working principles principle is between fuel cell and lead acid battery or batteries in general are the same. So, 
Uh, what we have seen here, that was a more um, thematic uh, view. And uh, if you transfer that uh, schematic view in a real cell, you could see here that is the uh, compartment for the hydrogen, for the oxygen. And between, you have the electrolyte. And here in the reaction layer, you have also the cathode. So, and now um, that is the um, most difficult uh, figure in my lecture. The question is uh, which electrolyte uh, we pick for, uh, uh, for the fuel cells. What you could see here, that is the specific conductivity. The larger, the better. The better is the uh, conductivity, and that is the temperature. You could see that in uh, Celsius, and here that is the reverse of the temperature. That is the, we call that Arrhenius curve. That is not important. Important is you need uh, a minimum conductivity from about one Siemens per centimeter. If you are lower, then the power of your fuel cell or your battery is too low. So and if you look into that figure, you see only four, I have four different uh, electrolytes which have a higher uh, conductivity than one Siemens per centimeter. Additional to that four blue points, you have silver. Uh, it's a high conductivity, but uh, silver batteries that uh, would be too expensive. So that means uh, we transfer now that um, four electrolytes in that system. So we could, uh, we have a uh, proton conductivity or H product conductivity, carbonate conductivity, and uh, oxygen conductivity. And um, we transfer also the, the temperatures where that red line is crossed. And you could see the uh, protons on the OH are crossed by about 50 up to 100 centigrade that line. The carbonate is about at 500 centigrade and the oxygen at about 1000 centigrade. So, and that temperatures which are related to the crossing on the one uh, Siemens per centimeter, that are also the operating temperatures of the fuel cells. So, and that uh, is the, um, bring you on the uh, different uh, fuel cell systems. Again, we figured out the uh, four uh, electrolytes with the four ions. And uh, this um, oxygen ion, that is the basic or the so-called solid state oxide um, fuel cell, SOFC. If we're using the carbonate, that is the molten carbonate fuel cell working at 650 centigrade. And if we are using electrolytes with protons on the OH, then you have the phosphoric acid fuel cell, the PEM fuel cell, and the alkaline fuel cell. So what we uh, differentiate now is the temperature lower or, or higher than 200 centigrade? That is the high temperature fuel cell. And lower than 200 centigrade is the low temperature fuel cell. But this increasing uh, temperature, operating temperature, the efficiency is increasing. And that is a very important parameter, the efficiency. Uh, what you could see here, that is the theoretical as thermodynamical efficiency is going down with increasing temperature. But in practical, this uh, curve is growing, this uh, increasing temperature. That is related to uh, lower uh, resistance at higher temperature. So this the SOFC at about 1000 centigrade, you have um, 
about 60-70% efficiency. The other, other important point for that systems are the start-up time. For example, if you want to start now a fuel cell uh, vehicle, um, you could do that with the low temperature fuel cells in seconds, 10, 20 seconds. But uh, to start up um, SOFC systems, you need one day. So the start up time is uh, growing, with growing temperature, and the dynamics uh, is growing uh, with decreasing temperature. Dynamics, that means um, I want to change my um, speed from 50 to 100 kilometer per hour. And that is very easy with the low temperature fuel cells, but is um, nearly impossible in uh, short times with high temperature systems because the temperature takes influence on the uh, ceramic structure. And um, if the ceramic structure is changed, then uh, the lifetime uh, is uh, reduced as well. So, Therefore, the high temperature fuel cells are used for stationary fuel cells. That means for uh, yeah, uh, utilities, for uh, residential stationary fuel cell, for uh, heating and electricity. And the low temperature fuel cells is a high dynamic start up time, not so high efficiency, are used for mobile. Uh, fuel cells. And the most important of that uh, three uh, low temperature fuel cells is the so called PEN fuel cell. Uh, the PEN fuel cell has a special electrolyte that is a polymer. Uh, this is a phonic acid. So that means it's the acid in the polymer. And uh, that is the special uh, sulfonic acid in the polymer uh, that is not so important. Important is that part is the polymer gives that the solid um, uh, solid aggregate, aggregate uh, yeah, the solid state. And only that one, the red one, that is the functional group. And the functional group that is dissociated in that conductive ion. So only that ion is important for us, and that ion is created from that complicated chemical uh, compound. Uh, the power of uh, the voltage of the PEM fuel cell is in the region of 0.5 up to 0.7. For example, the voltage of the lead acid battery is 2 volt, on the lithium ion battery 3 up to 4 volt, um, but we need higher voltages in order to drive the car. What we could do, we could uh, connect that in series uh, for higher voltages. Um, so we connect uh, the anode with the cathode, and that way by uh, external wire. But you could uh, use uh, also that external wire as a kind of cell wall between cell one and cell two. And that is uh, electronic conductive, conductive, and that is called so called the bipolar plane. And all the fuel cell stacks are built up not in that way, they are built up in the bipolar stack way. So you are putting um, your uh, hydrogen uh, anode part here, then you the bipolar plate, and step by step you are coming uh, to a pen fuel cell stack, which you could see here with a higher voltage. So that was the stack, and uh, what you have seen before, that is here. 
But for working that stacks, um, you need also uh, additional systems. Uh, the air uh, has to be compressed and the air has to be um, humidified uh, in order to have a higher conductivity of the nephion electrolyte. So, and then you have a second part that is a hydrogen tank. And uh, for the hydrogen tank, you could use normally, or you could use liquid hydrogen um, combination and compressed uh, gas. The liquid hydrogen has the advantage, and uh, it has a high uh, specific uh, energy. You could uh, per uh, volume or per mass, uh, per mass uh, store a lot of uh, hydrogen, but in the liquid state, that is uh, about minus uh, 270 centigrade, and uh, you have losses uh, by evaporation of that hydrogen at that deep temperature. So, um, per day, um, about two, three percent um, of the hydrogen uh, is going out of the system. That is the boil off loss. And uh, if you are on the airport parking for two weeks, then a lot of your uh, hydrogen is evaporated. Therefore, now uh, mostly is used the compressed gas with about 700 bar. So, and uh, your fuel cell system is um, principally divided in the fuel cell stack with the uh, compressor, humidifier, and so on. And that fuel cell stack gives you the power, gives you the kilowatt. And the energy of the system is given only by the tank, by the hydrogen tank. So you could increase the energy of the system only by increasing the volume of your hydrogen tank or the pressure of the hydrogen tank. That is important because that is not the case in the battery. You could uh, tear the energy and the power. You have the choice to independent uh, to change the power, at constant energy or vice versa. So, and finally, that uh, fuel cell system is uh, integrated uh, in the car. You have the electric engine or starting with the fuel cell stack. Uh, that is, you could set here. Then the hydrogen storage tank, you could set here. And normally, also a battery is integrated in the fuel cell electric vehicle in order to. Um, recharge the braking energy. If you uh, brake the car, then that energy is uh, generated via um, generator in the car and electricity, and that one uh, is stored in the uh, battery. And the battery is also um, uh, helps the car to accelerate uh, in the beginning of, uh, of, of driving. So you have normally uh, in the cars a battery with about one uh, kilowatt hour. And then you have the power control unit. That is the uh, figure for the uh, Honda Clarity. So uh, now the question battery battery or fuel cell vehicle um, that line gives you the energy of the operating time if you need a larger operating time you need a larger battery so the mass is increasing for the fuel cell uh, only for the power the mass of the power is the same that is independent on the energy only the hydrogen tank that uh, is increasing. So, and in order to see the whole fuel cell system, you have to add it that. And, uh, and you could see uh, for lower uh, operating time, lower energy, energy, you have the same fuel cell, 
but for higher energy, we have a higher hydrogen tank. So, and so you could see, you have a crossing point here. Uh, before the crossing point, you have a lower mass uh, of the battery, and after the crossing point, you have a higher mass of the battery. That means you have a critical time or a critical energy. Before that one, the battery is your choice. So that means for short distances and also light cars. And after that point, you have the fuel cell as the choice, and that one is for higher energy and higher operating time, that is for long distance cars and heavy cars. Um, that is shown here. For example, that is the range. If you have a light car in the city, for example, here, that is the battery electric vehicle. If you come also in the city to larger cars, to heavier cars like buses, then you, you should use the fuel cell. The same is with the distance. You could use also such small car, it's a battery car, but if you go to higher ranges, the highway, 400, 500 kilometers, then you need the fuel cell. So again, I'm going back. Uh, the battery is for short distances, light cars, and the fuel cell is for long distances and heavy cars. Uh, in the meantime, um, many car manufacturers uh, like Volvo and Daimler developing now fuel cells for trucks, uh, medium trucks, heavy trucks in, in that region, and that is based uh, on the 30 kilowatt stacks. Um, commercially, we have, you could see that uh, cars here. Uh, the price is in the region of 7,000, 8,000, and uh, the range is uh, 400, 500, up to 600 uh, kilometers. That is the last one for you and I, about 750 kilometers. So, uh, shortly to the cost, that is extrapolated for 80 kilowatt stacks, and you could see. Um, uh, two years ago, that was about $50 uh, per kilowatt. And uh, the strongest costs are coming from the catalyst. You could see that here, uh, if you have a higher production rates, then the uh, catalyst costs are reduced, aber, but they are um, still the highest part of the whole system. The costs are com uh, coming also from the system, the fuel cell system. You could see that here this is a very complicated system with electrons, oxygen, water, water, and the battery is much easier. Uh, the cost um, between the fuel cell electric vehicle and battery electric vehicle is a factor of two. So electromobility uh, in the moment, 400 kilometer for the batteries, for the fuel cell, 600. If you look to the efficiency, the fuel cell electric vehicle in the fossil area is uh, more efficient. In the uh, regenerative area, uh, the efficiency of the battery is much higher. The battery cars than the efficiency of the fuel cell vehicle. You could see that here, the reason uh, for that is the high uh, efficiency of the battery. The efficiency of the fuel cell uh, is only uh, 50%. So, and uh, so you have the contradiction of range and efficiency. And so the car manufacturers are developing city cars with the battery and long range and heavy cars. For the fuel cell. The status quo is uh, for 2018 only 8,000 uh, fuel cell cars 
but 5.5 million battery electric uh, vehicles. So summary, that is the last one. We have uh, no battle, battle between the fuel cell electric vehicle and battery electric vehicles. The fuel cells are for long distance and heaviest vehicle and the battery is for shorter distance and lighter vehicles. And the market introduction for the fuel cell electric vehicles is on about five up to 10 years. Uh, but the market introduction for battery vehicles, that is now. So thank you very much for your attention. Oh, a little bit longer, sorry. Thank you very much, Professor Gashe, for this um, interesting presentation and giving us the, the um, a good overview about the history and also the working principles of fuel cells. Um, I think now we uh, directly dive into the Q&A part. And I think I'm sure we have a lot of questions from the participants, which uh, Lena collected and will redirect uh, to you now. Um, to all of you who still have questions, feel free to um, write them into the chat box now, and then we are happy to answer them as much as possible. So I think with that, Lena, I would hand over to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for that presentation, Professor Dr. Garche. Um, I think we have a very different range of questions, but I think they will nicely um, accompany your presentation because uh, I think they will cover various aspects of what you've talked about. So one question that we received is, in Germany, currently 95% of hydrogen is produced from fossil natural gas, which increases CO2 emissions instead of reducing them. How do you assess how fast we can switch to 100% renewable or so-called green hydrogen? Yeah, um, this is not only in Germany, this is nearly worldwide. We have at the moment uh, yeah, around 95% of the hydrogen, the Korea hydrogen is coming uh, from the uh, fossils and uh, the switch to the um, renewable or to the green hydrogen, that depends uh, um, from the cost. So in the moment, the cost of the um, green hydrogen is a factor of two larger than of the fossil uh, the gray hydrogen. And uh, we have to come down, uh, ways uh, to come down with the cost uh, uh, the cost um, of the electrolyzers, um, which we have shown in the beginning, um, 18 up to 18.6, the first electrolyzer was developed. Uh, but uh, because the, uh, the gray hydrogen from the fossil um, is so cheap, nobody has really developed uh, efficient, uh, efficient uh, electrolyzers. So now um, we are developing uh, efficient electrolyzers, cheaper, uh, more efficient, and uh, step by step, um, I think during the next uh, 10 years, we will have about, let's say, uh, 20, 30 percent uh, green hydrogen uh, in Germany. And that is a real success. Uh, which is also driven by the introduction of the renewable in the electric grid. Uh, now we have about 30, 35 uh, percent um, uh, electricity in the German grid coming from renewable. So the 100 percent is still a bit off in the future, in your opinion? Uh, yeah. Um, we have uh, besides the gray, the fossil one, and the green one, also the so-called blue one. Um, that is uh, fossil hydrogen, where the carbon dioxide uh, is stored uh, under the sea, uh, under the air, and uh, different uh, storage systems. So that could be a, a period uh, from the gray uh, to the green one, uh, the carbon uh, dioxide capture. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so another question I have here is, uh, how do you assess the production capacities and the motivation of the private sector, for example, car, bus, or truck manufacturers, to produce enough fuel cell vehicles to reach sustainable and carbon neutral mobility? Uh, yeah, this is uh, like in every product, uh, the cost is uh, determined, um, the motivation, uh, you have uh, every country uh, a group of uh, uh, so-called freaks uh, which like the renewable cars and the renewable energy uh, but uh, the average of the people if the um, they, they are both, um, asking about 2000 people uh, how much you will pay more for uh, sustainability five up to ten percent the people were willing to pay more for the uh, for the um, yeah a better uh, environmental um, technology and the same is uh, we have here we have to come down with the cost uh, and political framework uh, could uh, regulate it as well we have now the um, yeah, we uh, reduced um, prices from about um, up to 10,000 euro for uh, batteries and and, uh, and uh, fuel cell electric vehicle cars. So uh, again, uh, political framework and uh, cost reduction that uh, are the ways uh, to come to higher uh, higher numbers of Mm -hmm. uh, not of produced cars, of sold cars, because that that is the problem. To producing uh, cars, I talked to a manager from Toyota about five years ago because he announced a small series of cars, and I asked him, and he told me we can, we can produce hundred thousand uh, cell cars per year, but uh, our Economics uh, told us um, we can't sell 100,000 um, cars per year. But uh, Hyundai has a strong target for 2030. They want to produce per year 700,000 future cars. And I'm sure um, they are coming in that region, maybe not 700, but 500,000 cars. I have one other question here, which I think goes very well with what you just uh, elaborated on. So one participant asked, how do you suggest to close the cost gap for fuel cell trucks other than subsidies? Again, sorry. So the how? question is, if you have any idea of how this uh, cost, cost gap could be closed other than with subsidies. So you've already mentioned that policy measures are important to encourage people to switch to different um, buying behavior. Is there anything else other than subsidies that you see that could potentially reduce this cost gap that you're describing? Yeah, if you um, remember that figure where I show the um, large cost um, uh, of the fuel cell system which were uh, related to the catalyst. So uh, we started um, at about, um, I remember, 20 years ago, uh, we started with 10 milligram platinum per square centimeter. Now uh, we are in the region of uh, 0.1 uh, gram platinum per square centimeter. That is uh, even too much. But um, the R&D labs are working now and platinum free catalyst. So that that big part uh, of the cost, um, the catalyst uh, could be come down. And then besides that, you have uh, of course also the mass production effect, which is um, not related to the materials, of course, but, but uh, related uh, to the process. And uh, so you could come down uh, to the cost uh, to the region of um, yeah, the, the battery costs. But not yet. I think um, we need about 
um, 10 years to come. It is because the cost, uh, not with the political framework, with the real cost uh, in the region of the internal combustion engine and in the region of the uh, battery electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. And there's one more question going in a similar direction or asking also about um, sort of the market readiness. Um, so looking at fuel cell manufacturing, most of the economies of scale are achieved with a single plant volume of 50 to 100,000 units a year. How does that relate to overall market volume? So what are the annual sales volumes that um, you think are needed in order to reach a plant of that size? Uh, yeah, that is related to what, what I um, uh, mentioned. Uh, the market volume is not the production volume. The market volume is that volume uh, of cars which you could sell. And uh, that depends on, uh, again, of the cost and uh, uh, from the political framework. I repeated that. The political framework is not only um, the, the reduced uh, or additional 10,000 euro for buying a car, but it is also the introduction in the uh, in downtown, in the cities, that is the use of uh, special lines um, on, the, uh, yeah, on, the, on the roads and so on. Um, mm -hmm. And that depends on the, um, and that gives you then the uh, production volume. That is not from the technical point of view. From the technical point of view, I, meant, I mentioned that the big OEMs are uh, ready to produce uh, 100,000 cars, but you have to sell that. And you and I, we have to buy it. And we will do it if we see any advantage. That uh, advantage is, uh, could be the environment, Cost and should be or could be also the cost, not the um, investment cost, uh, also the uh, cost for for the fuel. The cost for the fuel is relatively high at the moment. We pay in Germany about uh, nine euro per kilogram uh, hydrogen, and um, that uh, price has to, or that cost has to that price has to go down to about four and three. Then um, the motivation for all of us is uh, high enough to buy cars and then the uh, production volume will increase. Aber, but so uh, you have seen uh, two years ago, we have about uh, summarized, integrated uh, eight in, or 6,000 cars. That is not too much. And that's a significant decrease that you're describing from nine down to four or three. Yeah. Um, so another question we have here is how do you see the future development potential of both technologies, so battery electric and the fuel cell technology, regarding the tipping point of the range and application? Is one more promising than the other? Uh, yeah, um, the, another big problem. Let's say we are coming um, to the point um, of uh, the same cost of battery and uh, the fuel cell car. Um, in the moment, we have now 6 million or two years ago, 5.5 million uh, battery electric vehicle. And so the infrastructure is in the moment related to the battery electric vehicle. We are building charge station, uh, fast charge station, the, uh, um, uh, the C shops and the repairing shops uh, are related to uh, battery electric vehicle. And if in 10 years, for example, um, the uh, fuel cell car is competitive, competitive, then um, yeah, well, most of the people are um, related or, or the yeah, related to, to the battery cars. So the um, community doesn't speak in the moment about the normal, normal people 
let's not speak about fuel cell cars. All people speaking now about the battery car. Um, and uh, in 10 years, I hope um, that a window of opportunity to come on the market will be still open. So that means um, we have also um, hydrogen infrastructure. So we have enough uh, gasoline, uh, we have enough hydrogen uh, stations. And uh, that infrastructure is the second point uh, for um, the motivation to buy such a car. Uh, if you buy now a battery car, you could, um, in Germany or not only in Germany, you could uh, charge a car on every point where you have a grid. Uh, but the hydrogen car, you could charge only on a hydrogen station. Uh, fortunately, in Germany, we have now about 100 um, hydrogen stations, mm -hmm. but that is um, not yet enough um, to, to push the, the motivation. Uh, that is, um, if you think back um, for the introduction of lead, uh, lead free uh, gasoline, that was the same situation. You, you buy a new technology, um, <clears throat> which uh, works only with gasoline which out um, without uh, the lead uh, to, to use the octane number and you have no stations, gasoline stations, uh, is lead free um, gasoline. So step by step, um, that takes time. And uh, from my point of view, Germany, uh, there is a good political framework but we need about five to ten years to come on the same uh, level uh, like the battery cars. And uh, again, um, the battery cars are the cars um, for, for the short uh, distances. So for the city uh, and yeah, up to three, 400 kilometers. And the fuel cell uh, cars that are trucks and so on, that is um, not so related to the private people, that is more related um, to the industrial uh, people. So bus production or uh, bus lines and taxis and so on. So the, the future for the, for the private uh, people which are using the cars, the second car, that will be um, a battery car. Mm -hmm. uh, if you drive long distances and uh, heavier uh, cars, that will be the fuel cell car. Mm -hmm. um, there's one more question that I think we can make within the time remaining. Um, the question is, what is the round trip efficiency of hydrogen? Can it ever be in par with battery electric vehicles and how? I have shown that uh, before um, the round trip um, efficiency, let's say you have, um, you have the grid, uh, the electricity is coming uh, is 100%, yeah, uh, that's, um, then uh, for the production of hydrogen uh, via gasoline, uh, sorry, via the electrolysis, that is uh, 75 percent. You have a loss of 25. Then you have uh, about, let's say, a loss of 10, 20 percent by transporting the hydrogen uh, from the electrolysis to the uh, hydrogen station, filling station. That is a loss of 40 or 50 percent, and then the efficiency of the fuel cell is about 50 percent, so you have 25 30 percent. For the battery, that is the interesting the battery loss. If you take uh, the, the current, the renewable current, bring it in the battery and charge it and uh, discharge that, the loss is five up to 10 percent. So, and then again, you have uh, DCAC losses and so on. 
altogether battery uh, cars uh, for battery cars the overall efficiency is 75 percent and uh, for the fuel cell electric vehicle cars it's about 30 35 percent also let's say one to two about mm -hmm. okay marvin i think uh, in the interest of time I hand over to you. Thanks, uh, Professor Dr. Garche, for answering all these questions. Uh, yeah, back to you, Marvin. Thank you very much to Lena and Professor Garche for this interesting Q&A session. We will, of course, uh, try to answer all open, open questions in a follow-up email if there are still open questions. And if you want to learn more, um, you can also find us on all social media platforms, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, etc. And yeah, we hope that you enjoyed this first episode um, or this first part of this episode, the battle for e-mobility. And of course, we uh, invite you to join the second part, uh, which will be held on September 16. And I will also post the link in a second into this chat box and you will go get a follow up email as well. Um, yes, and I think uh, thank you very much again to all of you for participating and your interest. And on that note, uh, I'm, th I'm saying thank you very much and see you for part two of this charging station. Bye-bye, everyone. Everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks. Thank you.